And for the last talk in this session, we have David Meltzer, who's going to talk about uh, predicting course performance. So this is not a la large language model um, uh, talk. We've been looking at the connection between student scores on pre-instruction diagnostic, diagnostics and their final course grades in introductory physics. And uh, we've gotten a lot of useful data from a number of institutions I want to acknowledge. So we use three, up to three different pretests. One is a math, a uh, little math diagnostic that covers pre-college math. The other ones are the force concept inventory, a physics concept test, and the Lawson test of scientific reasoning, which I'll describe in a moment. The math diagnostic uh, covers topics like finding unknown sides and angles of a right triangle, simple algebraic problems, um, finding the slope of a graph, area of a circle in a triangle. The most complicated problem here is two, variable, uh, two equations, two unknowns. The Lawson test is uh, sort of set in both physical and life science settings. It attempts to probe students' ability to do probabilistic reasoning, uh, proportional reasoning, control of variables reasoning, and correlational reasoning. That's 24 items on it. So in general, what we find is that the, there, there is a positive correlation between scores on those pre-instruction tests and final course grades. They vary a lot from course to course. They're generally not very high correlations. Um, but, but the slopes of the fit lines are relatively high, and so you do get predictability. And let me explain what I mean. There's an example of a made-up data set that has very high correlation, but very, very little change in the responding variable to big differences in the predictor variable. By contrast, there's a lot more scatter in the data here, less correlation, but if you look at the top and bottom quartiles, for instance, of the predictor variables, you see a significant difference in the responding variable. And so that's what I'm going to be focusing on. I'm focusing on top and bottom quartiles. I'm kind of leaving the middle out of the discussion. Um, and so what we see uh, is, first of all, there's no one best fit model that fits every class. It's different from class to class. But what we do see that students with high scores and diagnostic pretests have much higher probability of receiving high grades than students with low pretest scores and much lower probability of receiving low grades. And let me quantify that a bit. When I say it doesn't vary, it means it was true in 95, more than 95% of the cases we looked at. When I say high scores, I mean top quartile in their class. High grades means top quartile in their class. Much higher probability means generally between 200 and 500% higher probability, so it's pretty big. And when I say low pretest scores or low grades, I mean bottom quartile in their class. So the, here's an example of the question we ask. A student who did, had a high top quartile score on a pretest, on one of the diagnostic pretests, what is the probability that student will get a high grade, meaning top quartile grade, in their class? and compare that to a student who low, scored low on the diagnostic pretest. What's their probability of getting a high grade in the course? And sort of the converse problem asking about low grades. So the sample includes 25 introductory physics classes from five different campuses at four universities, more than 2,000 total students uh, included. I should say that most of the instruction in these courses was non-traditional, included a lot of interactive uh, interactive work and research-based materials and methods. We, the, if you look at the course code, that's first and second semester of the algebra-based course and the calculus-based course, and those are the institutions. So as I said, the consistent result is that high scores get, are much more likely to get high grades. And here's an example of some of the data. Uh, this is the math, using uh, the mathematics diagnostic pretest. And in this column, what you see is the students who scored in the top quartile on that pre-instruction test, the one I just showed you, actually, that math test. So they scored top quartile, and this is the percentages, the numbers there re uh, correspond to the, their probability of getting a top grade, a top quartile grade in their course. This group is the students who scored low on that math pretest, bottom quartile. 
and their probability of getting a top quartile grade in their course. And this is the ratio between the two. And you see there is one outlier, but generally the ratio is big, two to three, four to one. And um, yeah, so almost four to one on the average. High scores, much more likely to get a top grade. And this is similar data for the Lawson test. I won't go through it in, in detail, I'll just cut to the chase here, which is a ratio of five, more than five to one, higher probability of getting a high grade. So, and this follows through for the FCI as well. So the high scores on the pretest were much more likely, much more likely to get a high grade in the course. And what about getting low grades? Again, skipping over the details, low scores on the pretest were much more likely to get a low grade in the course, which means bottom quartile grade, than students who scored in the high on the pretest. And again, you see the ratios are all in the three to four to five range. And we did, there are a total of 110 comparisons. This pattern held in 97% of the cases we examined, very consistent. I want to point out that regression analysis can be very misleading on this stuff. There's a lot of scatter, there's low correlation, and you, so you don't see some of the results you see when you do that quartile comparison. I'll just take a, one example. This is a class at University of West Florida, grade points as a function of FCI pretest scores. There's 53 students in the sample. The correlation coefficient is only 0.112. It's not even significant. But that's not the whole picture. So if you chop it up into top and bottom quartile grades, top quartile grades above that red line, and top and bottom quartile on the FCI, and you look at the quadrants, students uh, who got, did well on the FCI and got high grades, there's five of them, by comparison, students who did poorly on the FCI and got high grades, only two of them. And students who did poorly on the FCI and got low grades, three of them, and who did well on the FCI and got low grades, only one. So these numbers are very small. <laughs> but when you add them up for a lot of courses, and here I'm adding them up for all the 20 classes that took the Lawson test. And so if you look at those who got high pretest scores and high grades, or low scores and low grades is 353 of them. In other words, fitting the pattern I'm telling you about, and the ones who didn't fit the pattern, there's only 75 of them. In other words, low pretest score but high grade, or high pretest score and low grade. So it's a ratio of almost five to one. So as an alternative to regression analysis, um, here's one approach that, that could think of other ways, but stratify the sample into high and low scores on one of the pretest measures, like FCI, and then further subdivide each of, those, each of those groups and see if the second predictor variable is useful. So here's what I mean. We know if we divide them up into their FCI pretest scores, we know that the um, high FCI scores have higher grades and the low ones have lower grades. Suppose we slice them up according to the Lawson score. Do we get additional predictive value? And so here is the biggest sample is from Colorado, 466. So this is the group that did top quartile in the FCI pretest. So split them up into those who did well on the Lawson test and poorly on the, relatively poorly on the Lawson test. Probability of a top grade. Well, it's a big difference, big difference, two to one ratio. Probability of a bottom quartile grade. Big difference again, much higher probability of getting a low grade if they did poorly on the Lawson test, even if they did well on the FCI. Look at the bottom quartile group. These are the students who did poorly on the FCI and split them up into the top and bottom on Lawson. Again, you see the same pattern. If they did well on Lawson, 23% with a high grade. If they did poorly on Lawson, none. Not a single one out of that huge sample got a high grade can't even calculate a ratio. And for the probability of low, low grades, same thing, the same, same thing, almost a two to one ratio. So even when you separate them according to one of the predictor variables, if you further split them with the other variable, you get more, um, you do get significant predictability. So despite my caveats about um, uh, regression analysis, I'll show you a couple of models here. This is that, um, this is the, um, the big course. And you see, uh, it seems to say that the Lawson 
is heavier weight, at least in this course, than FCI. Uh, the R squared is not very high. Including an interaction effect doesn't change anything here. If you just cut out the middle and just look at the top and bottom quartiles, you do get better predictability. The R squared is up to you know, 0.27. And this is a, um, a class where all three of the predictors are used, Lawson, Math, and FCI. And you get R squared is pretty big, 0.36. If you, but you know, it's a relatively small sample, less than 40 students, so not very significant. Um, let me skip over that. I'll just show you the, uh, the um, fit. If you cut out the middle, if you cut out the middle and just look at top and bottom quartile grades, the R squared is up to 0.48. So I've left out motivational factors. They are significant. I just don't have time to talk about them. So to summarize, there's lots of factors, obviously, that influence physics students' course performance. The relative weight of calculational skill and reasoning skill and physics concept knowledge is going to vary from course to course, depending on the nature of the course. I just want to mention that our results are very consistent with other things that are in the literature, including some stuff that Eric has done, by the way. So thank you. All right, so <clears throat> we have about 20 seconds left. Um, <laughs> But because lunch is so short, I think I'm just going to call it. I will I'll add one like little soapbox thing, which is I would urge the community to think about the ethics of predictability algorithms like this and what it actually means for the humans we're using. So anyway, enjoy your lunch. And we'll be back here at 1.30. My hope.